John Wick Chapter 4 is a new John Wick movie where John Wick gets targeted by not so nice people wanting to kill him. So he shoots and punches and rolls and rams and tactical reloads his way through an army of grunts to get to the man at the end of the line. Except, uh, you know, now, now it's Chapter 4. I'm going to need a gun. Yeah, I know. And therein lies the issue. As amazing as these fights and cinematography still are, there's only so long they can keep the boat floating. There's only so many times you can get excited to see guys shoot guns while holding up their bulletproof jackets. Only so many times you can watch the same essential plot without getting jaded. And so, does that mean that John Wick at face value is becoming stale and repetitive? Yeah. Huh? Uh, but as a whole, I mean, no. Simply put, John Wick 4 is incredible, and what's really incredible about its in incredibleness, incredibility, is that a decade after birth, it keeps finding ways to do familiar action things while also feeling fresh and exciting. <laughs> See, every few years, an action movie comes along with a sequence so iconically amazing that it's remembered and referenced and reviewed far into the future. And with this movie, not only is there a sequence like that, there's like three of them. On top of which, almost every action sequence here also has some elements in it to set it apart not only from other weak sequences, but from all other action cinema. All to the point where we have now crowned another king of Hollywood action. Mission Impossible is the king of stunts and set pieces, Bourne is the king of greedy realism, Bond is the king of Britishness, and John Wick is the king of combat. And stairs. And the question then is, how do the filmmakers keep finding fresh and exciting action elements with this same concept when most other modern action blockbusters fail to deliver a single thing you haven't already seen? Is it because they're wizards? Well, in some part, yeah, but also no. What they're doing is they're identifying the core conceptual elements they have and then combining them with everything around them, with the world and with who and what's in that world. So today, although we've talked about the concept plenty before, let's do more of it in terms of action. Let's see how John Wick 4 uses the world and the people and things in it to create incredible fresh action. And then at the end, let's also look at the secret witchcraft methods it uses to find some of the greatest action sequences of all time and how you can do the same. Here's how to weaponize concept and conceptual elements. The first way this movie finds fresh action is by identifying the cores of its location and then pairing them up with its own cores, whether it gels together or not. As a great initial example, take the sequence where John flees Hitman into this big French roundabout, which I think is the name of it, the Big Front Roundabout, right, right next to Burger King. It's a location that's been in many movie sequences, yet this sequence is the greatest of them all, simply because it makes the most out of the location. If you look at the core of the setting, what is it? It's a big white ring, it's full of cars and endless traffic, it can be dangerous because of that. And when you combine that with the cores of John Wick, what do you get? Well, John Wick is John driving his muscle car, the combination of which results in him drifting around the wide space as he takes on his attackers. John Wick is also John getting into close combat with minibuses, the combination of which results in him fighting the henchmen while also having to dodge speeding cars. John Wick is also John mowing down grunts in a gunfight, the combination of which results in pure mayhem of bullets and endless traffic. John Wick is also a dog, so you get it. 
Yeah, so simply by combining the core elements of John Wick with the core elements of this place, you get a result that's very different visually and physically and dynamically than what John Wick action would be in another place. And while it may seem obvious now, it's not so much in the writing process. In 355, the wannabe female action blockbuster, there's a fight in a subway where the characters just fight in a subway without it mattering that it's a subway. And as I said in my video, it would have been much more if the location was used, if they fought while having to dodge passing trains. Because what's the point of setting action in a place if the place doesn't really affect the action? All you'll be is average. Is that it? I think so. And so, to be more like Wick, you need to identify what it is where you are and utilize that with what you are, whether the result is born from the elements fitting or not fitting. It can be a physical location, like the desert. This location means endless sand and sun and light clothing and long range distances. And coupled with John Wick, you get a man in a black designer suit riding a horse as he shoots bad guys with his urban tactical short range pistol. It's a tiny scene, but already the choice to combine John Wick with the setting produces something that 99% of other movies don't have, not even the ones in the desert. But also, this can mean using the culture or gear or weapons or methods or anything that's prevalent within a location. Japan, historically, is about non-gunpowder combat, so that coupled with gunpowder combat gets interesting results. Sumo wrestlers taking on armored goons with assault rifles, arrows piercing bad guy's armor for John to finish off with a gun. Cool stuff that other movies without this setting cannot do. The vital thing, though, is to be aware of whether the location has already been mined dry, so to speak. Japanese culture, for example, has been very prevalent in Hollywood for a long time, so that by default may not be the best route for the freshest results. Which is why this sequence too is far from the best in the movie, because you've seen a lot of it before. Something very familiar about all this. But if there's gold left to mine, mine it. In Bullet Train, like I mentioned in that video, there was no big ending crash in the script. The script just ended at a station. It was when the John Wick people came along that they started to say, hey! we have a bullet train, which means we can do something that other action movies without a bullet train cannot do. And what is that? Well... So altogether, don't be content with just placing an action scene somewhere in a way that makes sense for the story. Also find a way to utilize that somewhere in a way that makes the most out of the scene itself. Stairs are an endeavor to climb, so how about pairing that up with John's usual endeavor of getting through an army of grunts? Now those two endeavors are the same. Now you've got something. The point is to use what's on offer where you are in a way that helps you. In the next movie, maybe John goes to a small Italian countryside town where the culture is often about family and being separate from the outside world. Maybe there are these two brothers in his way, brains and muscles, and he can't get past them because brains instructs muscles in the fight, like in chess or in Pokemon. <laughs> And they're unbeatable, they're like one person as two. That's already very different from John just fighting someone. And so then he has to climb this local challenge. He starts learning Italian to counter Brains' instructions. Every day while healing himself, he uses this app to do these short interactive lessons. And in three weeks, he's able to have a real life conversation in Italian. And now in the rematch, he can pick up on Brains' moves from muscles and react accordingly. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, the app is real and it's called Babel. So if you want to be like John Wick and learn a language to become a smarter person thriving in the changing world wherever you are, this is the best way. The app teaches you through a variety of efficient and fun hands-on methods, quizzes, games, podcasts, even live classes designed by real language teachers to get you talking in three weeks, in like 50 minutes per day. <laughs> sponsoring a 60% filmento discount with the link below or the QR code on screen. So if you want to utilize the world by learning a language, check it out.
Another way this movie finds fresh action is by giving its characters very specific tangible foundations and then building the action on those foundations. The obvious example of this is Kane, a hitman who has one little thing setting him apart from most other hitmen, which is that he's... Yeah, Kane is blind, or at least he's supposed to be. The movie doesn't really take it too seriously. But the reason it can be very helpful that he's blind is that the filmmakers can now construct his action upon that. In Japan, for instance, there's this action beat where Kane puts up these pingers and uses them to map the area and fight his opponents. Oh. It's not necessarily the greatest action beat ever, because again, it, it, it doesn't really seem to matter too much that Kane is blind, but what I'm getting at is that the fact that this fight is built on Kane's blindness allows it to be something very specific. You're not gonna see too many fight scenes with location pingers, because not too many action characters are blind, right? It's the specificity of Kane that creates the specificity of his action. A better example is this guy called Nobody, a bounty hunter tracking John. On the surface level, he has his own fighting style of being a scrapper and a combat style of being an old west gunslinger and he also has a dog with a taste for the most precious kind of jewelry. Nuts. <laughs> All of which is very useful in designing the action he partakes in. But what's really significant about Nobody is that he's a bounty hunter who's not there to collect the bounty, but rather make it higher. He's John's opponent there to kill him, except instead of just trying to do that, he's keeping John alive until the moment where the price is right. Notice how that very fundamentally mixes up the dynamics of the action as opposed to if he was just another bounty hunter. Again, I'm not saying nobody is necessarily the greatest character ever, because in some ways I do think he wasn't dark or menacingly driven enough for me to think he may actually be John's doom. But the idea itself is useful. The fact that he can turn on John at the worst possible moment. The fact that Kane has enough honor to fight on John's side moments before their duel. It makes the action very specifically different than if they were just more bad guys trying to get the kill. At least you have something to differentiate and remember them as well as their action. Because in a lot of modern actioners, the problem is the opposite, that there's no specificity. All the heroes in 355 are the same. Doesn't matter if they're CIA or BND or CCP or MI6 tech. All of them just indistinguishably punch and shoot bad guys in unison without issue to save the world from evil. You know, because I can totally see nothing happening when agents from the US and China are trying to get their hands on a new WMD. Why would your agency get the drive? Come on, trust me. Oh, okay. And so, much like with locations, identify who your character is and then build the action from that. For example, how can you conclude John's fight against the high table in a memorable way? Well, the high table is this very ancient power maintaining order in the assassin world, so maybe there is something there. For the old ways and the old laws, John Wick calls you to a duel. And what exactly are Mr. Wix's terms? Yeah, John's end of the road comes down to this old-timey duel against his friend representing the table's interests. Again, it's up to you whether that's good or not, but the point is that it's much more interesting and memorable to see John's conclusion happen in this manner than if it happened in just some other gunfight that could happen in any movie. This is a more exclusive conclusion that John Wick can have just because of who he's fighting. Your hands upon Fire! A dead man's gun and Joe looking down the sides. John Wick is special because he was a ticking kung fu time bomb set off by the demise of his dog. Bourne is special because he's an amnesiac constantly fighting from a lower stance of information. Private Cage is special because he's a noob soldier who has to die enough times to gain the skills to end the war. Even Kate Beckinsale in Jolt is special because she has this anger disorder that she can't control which leads to some un unusual stuff. So ask yourself, what is it specifically that your character is and how do you create your action from that?
finally, the overall way this movie creates fresh action is by constantly looking for extra variable elements to boost and lift the action into new heights with. For example, when John runs into this building in Paris, the only purpose of it is for him to lose his attackers and get to the church for the duel. All that needs to happen is that he can fight his way out. That's it. But instead of being content with just that basic requirement, the filmmakers ask, well, what if there's more? What if the attackers also carry dragon's breath shotguns? What if John gets one? What if we go all out on the visual mayhem? The scene doesn't require it per se, but regardless, looking for that extra thing turns it into one of the greatest action scenes of all time. And that's a very crucial mentality for every writer and filmmaker to adopt. Does Scott Atkins have to be in a fat suit at the club? No, he could be just Scott Atkins, it, it would be enough. But because he is this big guy with a literal body armor around him, it's something very different from all other Scott Atkins action scenes. Now, the scene is about John trying to stop this human rhino who cannot be stopped or kept down, until you come up with a more interesting demise for him by using his own size against them. It was at this moment that he knew. He fought. In a sense, think of it like those variable boxes in those Mario Kart games. The game would function without them just fine, yet their existence makes it all that much more exciting. And the beauty is that as long as the content of that variable box you're using is relevant to what you're doing, it can be anything. It can be tone and comedy, like John making a mockery of this dude with nunchucks instead of just shooting him. It can be location, like John fighting in a club full of dancers instead of in an empty room full of goons, like a roundabout with active traffic instead of halted traffic. It can be character, like Kane being blind even though there's nothing necessitating him to be blind. It can be visuals and camera, like doing a long one shot from the ceiling. It can be anything, where you are, who you're with, what you use, how you use it, anything. And when you choose the correct variable that really reinforces the purpose of your scene, action or not, it can even become the thumbnail for what the whole thing will be known and popular for. True Detective had that big one-shot amplifying the tension even though there was plenty tension without it. Dark of the Moon had that real-life urban wingsuiting scene that still exists in no other movie that happened just because Michael Bay was adamant to do it. Bullet Train could have ended at a station like in an earlier draft of the script, but it didn't and it's much more recognizable and better off for it. None of these variables were necessarily necessary and yet they elevated the material into something amazing nonetheless. And if you don't want to take it from me, if you don't want to take it from these few examples, then at least take it from the creator of Breaking Bad and how they always kept pushing and adding until they had something that really amplified what they were doing with things like tone and character. The actor Danny Trejo, his head chopped off with a machete. <laughs> we came up with this moment where, you know, what happened so to this great. guy? Well, his <laughs> head is on a giant desert tortoise, painted on the, on the tortoise, Ola DEA, and uh, one of our wonderful writers. He was quiet for a minute. He said, well, yeah, but then what happens? I said, what do you mean? You got a head on a tortoise. What else do you need? He says, well, I think the head should blow up. And everyone's <laughs> like, what? We don't need to do that. That's like, uh, we don't need that. <laughs> I said, oh, shit, you're right. And that's how the scene ends. And it, it would have been a, an okay scene, but it wouldn't have been nearly as, as truly yes. a non-submergible scene if, if the yes. head hadn't blown up. To be clear, there is such a thing as too much. A hat doesn't always look better with another hat on top of it. Huh? But regardless, do yourself a favor of not being content with the basic required version. Once you have your actions in written, take a step back and ask yourself, is this enough or is there some variable I can add to it to set it apart from the pack and make it into something really special that people will keep talking about? What could be my Dragon's Breath Shotgun? Thank you.